Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Colonel Bill Ryerson from the Marine Corps University, and uh, it's my honor to uh, be hosting uh, this combined naval address on climate, energy, and environment. Uh, really appreciate your uh, interest and participation today, and uh, I think we have a great uh, one hour program. Um, today's topic is climate challenges in the Caribbean, and we have a couple of fantastic speakers. Um, and on, on behalf of uh, our consortium of, of climate interested educational institutions, um, as I mentioned, I'm from Marine Corps University and uh, on behalf of uh, Naval Postgraduate School, Naval War College, the U.S. Naval Academy and the Naval Community College. Uh, it's exciting to, uh, to bring this topic to light. Um, we're going to start things off with some opening remarks uh, by the Honorable Meredith Berger, who is the Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Uh, for energy installations and environment. Uh, Ms. Berger was appointed to this role in, on July 28th, 2021. And among her many duties are to provide uh, oversight and policy for Navy and Marine Corps energy and climate resilience, infrastructure sustainment, military construction, acquisition, environmental protection, and safety and occupational health. With a background in policy and senior leadership roles in government and the private sector, Ms. Berger previously managed the Defending Democracy Project at Microsoft and served as Deputy Chief of Staff to Secretary of the Navy, Ray Mavis. She holds a master's degree from the Harvard Kennedy School, a Juris Doctor from Nova Southeastern University, and a Bachelor of Arts from Vanderbilt University, and has earned multiple prestigious service medals. Uh, Ms. Berger, thank you for joining us, ma'am, and we look forward to your opening remarks. Colonel Ryerson, thank you so much for the, the kind introduction, and it's a pleasure to be back here with the um, combined naval address on um, issues that I think are so critically important. Um, I am so glad that we have a consortium like this among our educational opportunities and such a robust attendance because um, this this is the stuff that um, is is on the margin of of how we succeed, and every little bit counts. And so, uh, to be considering this as a threat to the way that we operate and an enabler for mission success, if we do it right, is just so so critically important. And I know that we have two speakers here today, um, in Colonel Benjamin and also in Ramo Wemus Gorman. Um, thank you both for joining us today. Um, it is exciting to have your perspective um, and have you present for this conversation. Um, bringing together this group here today um, shows a shared priority that we have um, in the region, and it is making sure that we are building up our resilience together. Uh, the impacts of climate change are undeniable. We are seeing too much and too little water. We are seeing single storms wipe out uh, installations and whole economies. Um, this is impactful. Um, it is takes us as uh, the military first responders to be able to make sure that the community is whole and that we stay um, with our sights on mission and making sure that we are executing um, all that we need to do. Um, it puts a strain on, on mission. It adds to what we um, are required to do. It adds cost, it adds time, it adds all sorts of requirements um, to, to the many faceted roles that we already take on. And so um, I, am, I am proud to, to keep this focus um, where it rightfully should be in a place that uh, we see tremendous impact and tremendous opportunity. Uh, Vice President Harris, Earlier this year, um, or excuse me, it was uh, last year, I, I forgot we changed years, in 2022, um, set out our uh, collaboration uh, PAC 2030. This is the United States Caribbean Partnership to address the climate crisis. Um, this is a focus that Secretary Austin at the Department of Defense level, Secretary Del Toro at the Department of Navy level, uh, both Commandant and, and CNO uh, to, to me and to all of you around uh, the room and around, uh, around the online forum here are focused on. And so um, we are um, going to spend time today uh, to make sure that we are educated, to make sure that we are focused. And I wanted to orient you before turning it over to um, the, the experts and, and feature of our conversation here today. Um, that this is part of a very focused effort in the Department of Navy and in support of Department of Defense objectives and partnership um, 
with these uh, critical partners in the region. Uh, so we are um, very excited for a robust 2024. Today we gather in this forum to um, hear from experts and engage in conversation. February, March, and April, uh, we will be engaging with our Caribbean partners in specific workshops that are focused on areas that are of critical importance around health and safety, around uh, tech and uh, data sharing, and then uh, lastly, around resilience and uh, infrastructure strengthening and hardening. Um, we'll culminate in May with a tabletop exercise that exercises all of the things that we discussed that we uh, try out in our workshops. Um, and all of this will be in advance of our next uh, Atlantic hurricane season, which um, as uh, we all know, uh, presses upon that urgency and, and is that uh, mission um, stretcher that we face so often. So um, I am thrilled for the partnership that we are recognizing today, eager to hear the perspectives of our esteemed speakers and grateful to all of you for the attention that you are putting towards this uh, critical focus area for the Department of Navy and the way um, that we fight and the way that we win. So with that, I will turn it back over to the Colonel. Uh, thank you very much for letting me kick off and, and very eager for the conversation today. Thank you, Ms. Berger, for setting the stage and for those opening remarks. Uh, as we transition to our speakers, as, as you all know, we have, we have quite a lineup. Um, we're honored by uh, two Chiefs of Defense uh, staff uh, from Caribbean nations. So um, getting their perspective on, on the impacts to their region that they feel firsthand on a regular basis. Um, I think we're in for quite a treat. And so uh, our first speaker uh, this afternoon is going to be uh, Colonel Telbert L.A. Benjamin. Uh, Colonel Benjamin is the Chief of Defense Staff for the Antigua and Barbuda Defense Force. He enlisted in 1995, was commissioned in 1997, and has supported multiple regional security missions, including deployments to Granada in 2004, Barbados in 2005, St. Vincent and the Grenadines in 2009, Haiti in 2010, and Dominica in 2015. Colonel Benjamin served as a liaison officer to the Conference of the Armies of the Americas and liaison officer to the Conference of Defense Ministers of the Americas. He's a graduate of the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, holds a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of the West Indies, and a Master of Arts degree from Webster University. Colonel Benjamin embodies the Antigua and Barbuda Defense Forces motto, ready to serve. And we are thrilled to have him share his perspective with our group today. Colonel Benjamin, thank you for your, for your, uh, your remarks today. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon. And thank you very much, uh, Colonel Ryerson. Uh, just confirm everyone can hear me. We can. All right. Uh, let me be begin by saying uh, thank you for the invitation uh, to, to, to speak this afternoon. Um, to the leadership of Marine Corps University, as well as to the NEEC for this invitation. I would like to extend a warm Caribbean greetings to all of you in this forum today. The issues of climate change and its implications on small island states such as mine are of the highest importance to the Antigua Barbican Defense Force and therefore receives the greatest consideration. For Antigua Barbuda, climate change and climate related issues are considered as existential threats to the survival of our nation state. Antigua Barbuda is a small island in the Eastern Caribbean, and this is just to give perspective to those of you who may not know where we are. We are a multi island state with a population of approximately 100,000 people and a total area of approximately 170 square miles. Um, for comparison, we're, we're about twice the size, or a little bit more than twice the size of Washington, D.C. The island is approximately three hours flight from Miami and 40 minutes away from Puerto Rico, um, the nearest U.S. territories. On September 6, 2017, Hurricane Irma impacted the island of, of Barbuda as a Category 5 storm on the Safar Simpson wind scale with sustained winds in excess of 160 miles per hour and gusts as high as 180 miles per hour. As a result, as much as 95% of the structures on the island of Barbuda were either damaged or destroyed. 
The island of Antigua escaped any significant damage and was poised to support not only Barbuda, but other islands that were being impacted by Hurricane Irma. On September 9th, 2017, Hurricane Jose approached the island once again as a category four storm with sustained winds of 155 miles per hour. Anticipating the possible worsening of conditions, the government of Antigua Barbuda issued a mandatory evacuation order for the island of Barbuda. On September 18, 2017, Hurricane Maria, the third hurricane in less than two weeks, became a Category 5 hurricane once again, threatening the islands and causing devastation on the neighboring island of Dominica, with winds in excess of 175 miles per hour. Maria left a line of devastation across the Eastern Caribbean before continuing north, just missing the Bahamas. The 2017 storm season and the subsequent years mark a turning point for the Antigua Barbuda Defense Force and the people of Antigua and Barbuda, obviously. The storms that impacted my island were not simply the most powerful that we had experienced in recent history, but the effects forced us to review our capability requirements to operate and achieve mission success. Coupled with that, in recent years, we have been impacted by other extremes in climate, climatic conditions, including rising temperatures, rising sea levels and coastal erosion, and periods of prolonged drought. I do not have enough time, obviously, to talk about the obvious implications of the latter issues. Suffice it to say, as a result of the continued deficit in rainfall, Antigua and Barbuda is probably the country most dependent on desalination of seawater for domestic use in the Eastern Caribbean. I would like to focus for the next few minutes on the direction the ABDF is pursuing in light of the climate-related challenges that confront us. As you would appreciate, the ABDF is a small organization designed and built specifically to support the defense of the nation state. The force has an infantry battalion, which includes an infantry company, a services company, and a reserve company. Additionally, there is a Coast Guard unit, which employs a fleet of interceptor-type vessels. We also have an air wing that includes two aircraft. And finally, we are responsible for the National Cadet Program, which is a youth program not dissimilar from your ROTC program running your high schools in the U.S. Further, as a nation, Antigua and Barbuda is a focal point in the regional response system with responsibility to support the islands of St. Kitts Nevis, the British dependencies of Montserrat, Anguilla, and the British Virgin Islands, and also the island of St. Martin during HADR related events. In this regard, we manage on behalf of the regional mechanism the storage of resources provided by the international community. Additionally, we play a leading role in coordinating responses in the event of major regional incidents. The 2017 hurricane season highlighted the need for a more outward looking defense force. The force's deployment in response to the storms of 2017 season and subsequent years suggests that greater emphasis needed to be directed towards building, one, our engineering capability, secondly, the development of an outward looking emergency medical capability, enhancing our search and rescue capability in the maritime and urban domains, the development of aerial surveillance capabilities, and finally, the, the development of what we refer to as a robust public affairs arrangement. In the Defense White Paper issued in January of 2023, a five-pillar capability framework was presented outlining the way forward for the ABDF in light of the impacts that we would have had based on climate-related issues. Those five pillars include one, 
maritime domain awareness and enhancement of that, two, disaster response and climate change capabilities, three, support to law enforcement, four, greater efforts at national development, and five, support to regional peace and stability. Of the five pillars identified, three were directly related to the national effort of mitigating against climate-related scenarios. The third pillar, which highlights the issues of responding to and mitigating the risks related to climatic, climatic and other events, places emphasis on partnerships. In this regard, the Antigua Barbados Defense Force now provides direct support to our disaster management agency here in Antigua and Barbuda, similar to your FEMA. We also support the regional security system and the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency. Those are regional entities that support emergency and disaster response. Additionally, there is the implied tasks to the Defense Force of reinforcing national systems, such as our ports and our health infrastructure. In reorganizing to satisfy those areas mentioned above within the framework, extensive efforts are ongoing to do the following things. Firstly, train personnel and acquire resources to support the development of damage assessment and response teams capable of operating at the national as well as the regional level. Secondly, developing a an emergency medical capability that can support national emergencies. This concept was tested and proven during the national fight against COVID-19 between the periods of 2020 to 2022. This effort was boosted by the acquisition of two field hospitals in 2022 through the United States Southern Command. Thirdly, enhancing the forces search and rescue capability. Beyond our responsibility for maritime search and rescue, we have expanded to address aviation responses to the same, in addition to playing an enhanced role in the national as well as regional urban search and rescue efforts. Fourthly, an effort is ongoing to harden the forces facilities in response to the current and future effects of climate change and climate change related events. In doing this, we are pursuing the acquisition and installation or integration of off-grid concepts, such as rainwater harvesting and the use of solar energy. Those being tested currently for potential use across all ABDF facilities. Additionally, consideration is being given to relocate some critical infrastructure from coastal areas that may be susceptible to future sea level rises. Finally, the ABDF is pursuing partnerships in an effort to strengthen our ability to identify risks and mitigate against the potential impact of those risks on our. Let me begin, uh, let me return to the defense white paper that was issued in, in January of 2023. Yes, and sir. The five, Thank you. Pillars, the five pillars covered by that review. Of the five pillars identified, three were directly related to the national effort of mitigating against climate-related scenarios. The third pillar, that of disaster response and climate change, highlights the issue of responding to and mitigating of risks related to climatic and other events, placing emphasis on partnerships. In this regard, the ABDF now provides direct support to our management, our disaster management agency, similar to your FEMA. We also support the regional security system and the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, two regional entities geared towards disaster response within the Eastern Caribbean. Additionally, there is an implied task for reinforcing national systems, such as the ports and our health system here in Antigua and Barbuda. In reorganizing to satisfy the above mentioned framework, extensive efforts are ongoing to do the following. Firstly, train personnel and acquire resources to support the development of damage assessment and response teams capable of operating at the national and regional level. 
Secondly, developing an emergency medical capability that can support the national emergencies. This concept was tested and proven during the national fight against COVID-19 between the years 2020 and 2022. This effort was boosted by the acquisition of two field hospitals in 2022 through the U.S. Southern Command. Thirdly, enhancing the forces search and rescue capability. Beyond our responsibility for maritime search and rescue, we have an expanded we have expanded to address aviation related responses. In addition to playing a leading role in the national and regional urban search and rescue effort. An effort is ongoing to harden the forces facilities in response to the current and future effects of climate change related events. Off grid concepts such as rainwater harvesting and the use of solar energy are currently being assessed for use. Additionally, consideration is being given to relocate some critical infrastructure from coastal areas that may be susceptible to future sea level rise. Finally, the ABDF is pursuing partnerships in an effort to strengthen our ability to identify risks and mitigate against the potential impact of those risks on our personnel, our facilities, and our country. Interoperability is a central tenant in this effort. We recognize that in a resource scarce environment, building partnerships and enhancing our ability to work with those partners can and will reap tremendous benefits. We therefore partner with all stakeholders at the domestic as well as regional levels, and we pursue international partnerships as well. I conclude by quoting from my Prime Minister, the Honorable Gaston Brown, in his presentation at the recently concluded COP28 held in Dubai. And I quote, the irony is that small states that contribute the least to global CO2 emissions are its greatest victims, unquote. He goes on to state that, and I quote, the future weapons of mass destruction will not be bombs or guns. They will be scorching temperatures, persistent droughts, rising tides, and ferocious winds, end of quote. Ladies and gentlemen, might I suggest to those of you listening to me today, we in Antigua and Barbuda and the islands of my region are already living this reality. Once again, thank you to the organizers of this event for the invitation to speak. And I do look forward to any questions that might occur or might come forward at the end of this presentation. Thank you very much. Colonel Benjamin, thank you. That was a fantastic overview. Uh, and to hear firsthand the, the challenges that your nation and in your role as a, as a military leader faces is really brings it home. Uh, I remember Hurricane Irma and the, the devastation to, to hear you describe it is really is, is heartbreaking. Um, and, uh, and your relationship with Southcom is, um, is obviously very important. Uh, sir, thank you for that. Uh, we will do question and answer um, after our, our second speaker. And so um, we look forward to, to that portion of the program. Um, at, at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our second speaker. Um, and that's Rear Admiral Antoinette Weems Gorman. She is the Chief of Defense Staff for the Jamaican Defense Force. She has a 31 year career that includes groundbreaking achievements to include becoming the second woman in history to lead a national army when she was appointed to her current role on 20 January, 2022. Prior to that, as Force Executive Officer beginning in January, 2020, she provided strategic guidance and directed force policies for the previous Chief of Defense, playing a key role in transformational change in the Jamaican Defense Force. Additionally, Rear Admiral Weems Gorman has held roles as Brigade Commander, Maritime Air and Cyber Command, and Commanding Officer of the Coast Guard, and is a subject matter expert in regional maritime security. Admiral Weems Gorman is a graduate of the U.S. Naval War College, and holds a master's degree with distinction in national security and strategic studies from the University of the West Indies in Mona. Rear Admiral Weems Gorman, thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to your perspective on climate related challenges in the Caribbean. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Colonel Ryerson. Uh, confirm I'm being heard? Yes, ma'am, we hear you loud and clear. See, my staff officer is sharing some slides there whilst he gets in gets it into presentation mode. 
I will just proceed. Um, let me uh, start with the salutations, Honorable Meredith Berger, Assistant Secretary to the Navy for Energy, Installations and Environment, yourself, Colonel Ryerson, my colleague CDS from the Antigua and Barbuda Defense Force and the participants, good morning and thank you very much for including me in this discussion. Um, I think it's a very important issue and as my colleague indicated, it is a stark reality for us in the Caribbean region. Uh, I will be speaking generally about how the Caribbean region is affected these challenge by, by climate change. So these challenges directly affect the livelihoods of our already vulnerable population. Uh, most of our population depends on agriculture, fisheries, and specifically tourism. So the outcome of these relate, climate related events significantly negatively impact welfare, public health, food security, and of course, ultimately national security, which is why we are having this conversation as, as military organizations. So JDF then as uh, the military force for Jamaica, we have 10 main roles and four of those roles are specific and directly related to climate uh, related challenges. And like Antigua and Barbuda, we support other government agencies, most prominently the Office of Disaster Management, which is also our equivalent of FEMA, search and rescue, Disaster relief is a main role. And of course, in regional cooperation, we support our brothers and sisters in the other islands. So as I go through, I will complement what uh, Colonel Benjamin spoke about in a broader Caribbean context. He spoke more specifically about um, Antigua and I will go through speaking a bit broader. So let me start with some, um, some, some data and some specifics about the Caribbean, uh, the broader Caribbean. We have two distinct wet seasons, and, and these some are primarily aligned with the Atlantic hurricane season. And that season, you may all know, traditionally spans between 1st of June to the 30th of November every year. But what we have seen as climate change, the challenge of climate change evolves, that we are having systems that are forming outside of this band, and so it's less predictable. And so, in or you know, in in uh, when I just joined some time ago, you know, we were specifically gearing up for for um, you know events, hurricanes and and storm events within that band. Now it we we are seeing events occurring before and after the traditional or the the, the traditional um, hurricane season. We're also seeing that the wet and dry season have moved. They sometimes don't even occur at all. And as Colonel Benjamin also mentioned, significant um, difference in temperatures throughout the year. So historically, um, climate related devastation in the Caribbean has had significant impact on our economies and infrastructure. An IMF report quoted by UNDP said that natural disasters occur more frequently and cost more on average in the Caribbean than anywhere else, and even in comparison to smaller states. The Economic Com Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean conducted an analysis of, of these events in the Caribbean over the period 1990 to 2008. And that analysis found that Caribbean countries under review experienced 165 natural disasters, of which 61% were windstorm related events, that is hurricane floods and tropical storms. Um, unfortunately, Haiti, the Dominican Republic and Jamaica, which are located in the Northern part of the Caribbean, were the most affected by these natural disasters over the period, having experienced uh, 49, 34 and 21 natural events specifically. And that, um, estimated affected some 2.5 million people over the period of the study. Some more data here, total damage to the economic sector, $63 billion. 
your um, impact on the social sector, $57 billion. Total damage to infrastructure, $12 billion, and this is US dollars. And the impact on the environment, $3.5 billion. Now, these kinds of figures you're talking about exceeding just the budget of a small, a small country, the overall budget of a small country in the Caribbean. So you see the impact being very significant. UNDP also said that between 1963 and 2017, on average, countries within the Caribbean suffered yearly losses due to storm damage equivalent to up to 17% of their gross domestic product. So added to that is the impact of rising sea levels. Uh, Colonel Benjamin also referenced that. Some of our islands are very low-lying islands. And climate-related challenges lead to rising sea levels, rising atmospheric temperatures, more earthquakes, and of course, the extreme flood and drought events, and coastal erosion. This impacts our ability or our country's ability to earn the, the most coveted foreign exchange that our economy runs on, because most of the countries in the Caribbean, um, their economy is highly dependent. Twenty one hundred sea levels in the Caribbean are expected to rise to one point by by one point four meters, and this uh, this amount of sea level rise would translate into about seventy percent of our freshwater um, marshes and our brackish and saline wetland wetlands um, being destroyed or lost. Um, and you imagine the, the impact of that on fisheries and uh, the, these are the areas that protect our coastline as well and our nurseries for our fishing population and, and birds and so on. And so this study also indicated that the annual economic losses, if that should occur, um, would be 63 million US dollars for the region. So not only would we be losing, uh, having economic loss, but uh, most of our population live within three, three nautical miles of the, of the coastline in the Caribbean. And so there will also be displacement of our population. The loss of coral reefs um, and increasing in drought will cause a decrease in food security. It will lead to higher fuel consumption. And so those challenges now lead us to having to have a military perspective uh, on, on how we approach these challenges. Uh, so the amount of effects of climate-related challenges um, continue to worsen, and it could potentially, uh, the scarcity of resources could potentially cause worsen existing um, geopolitical tensions and contribute to conflicts. So as we look at it from a military perspective, we recognize that Climate-related disruptions can cause a, ver a variety of, of issues, you know, population displacement, risk to public health, impact on our food security, and the increased vulnerability to our critical infrastructures. There's also illegal migration, human trafficking can, can get into the, uh, the fray as a tangential effect of these events as displaced individuals seek refuge and currently in in the carib in the caribbean region we we are already struggling with issues of um illegal migration uh, and persons seeking refugee status from countries that already are in vulnerable positions that can be significantly exacerbated or in or uh, increased um with the advent of of things like hurricanes and droughts and food insecurity so JDF then looked at this when we did our strategic defense review and um, and we, uh, we have had to adjust our strategies and how we operate and how we build our own resilience. And so we have to look to partners to achieve some of it because of course, um, as small defense forces, we are not able to do all of that on our own. And so, one of the ways that the JDF decided that we would um, address it is to establish what we call a disaster assistance response team. And this DART 
um, we constitute, we have the capacity to constitute three darts. And they are, they, these persons are all are multidisciplinary and they are constituted before the Atlantic hurricane season. And they are in a constant state of readiness to deploy at short notice to locations that are impacted by natural disasters. Um, in the past couple of years, we have deployed the DART to Dominica, to the Bahamas. Um, we have uh, deployed the DART to, to Haiti as well. And, and so um, this is a 120-man strong team with all the different disciplines, as I indicated, and we have them on different um, notices to move once the hurricane season uh, is set up. So they're all vaccinated put together. Um, the, 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 um, the priority one group uh, does not uh, get leave during that period. So they have all their, their um, personal affairs in order should an event occur and we have to deploy them. We do that in support, of course, to regional setups such as SEDEMA, the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management um, regional response mechanism. And we acknowledge that um, this is, it is also important to build our resilience. And so in our defense review, we considered climate resilience when developing, as we have, are growing the force. And it is mandated, there are various mandates within our, our planning that we have to develop our infrastructure um, and build in resilience there. So not unlike my colleague in Antigua, we, we have looked to partners to achieve that. And we also seek to implement sustainable initiatives for, for climate resilience. Um, we have environmental protection policies that mandate the use of renewable energy, sustainable building designs, recycling of resources and the use of technology for water and energy conservation. And in fact, currently um, I have a, a pilot project to look at our fleet, um, transitioning our fleet to electronic, um, to EV, EVs, uh, where we, as we know, that's the, the future and to reduce our, our fuel consumption and our car carbon footprint as a force. All our new buildings have rainwater harvesting and um, great, Grey water reuse um, and recycling of, of that to ensure that we are reducing our own carbon footprint and the management vehicle fleet management systems to ensure um, minimal uh, use of, of, the, of our fleet and therefore less um, energy consumption. And of course, all the energy consumption and, and renewable energies we put solar. Um, into our build, uh, buildings. We are also um, ensuring that the, they are smart buildings, so to speak, so that you know, when you leave a room, the air conditioning goes off and so on and so forth. So the JDF response and resilience strategies are also in keeping with regional efforts. Um, we are responsible for the northwestern subregion of the Caribbean under Sedima, and that region consists of Bahamas, Belize, Haiti, and the Turks and Caicos. Um, we collaborate, of course, with the U.S. Southcom and our, our U.S. and Canadian partners, and there we we are we participate in regional systems such as the system of cooperation among American Air Forces, SICOFA, which who have implemented a climate resilience and response mechanism amongst their membership. And in the case of SICOFA, it has created SAVICO, which is a virtual room for coordination as part of its consolidated human aid op humanitarian aid operations. And we are able to participate there. Regional efforts towards climate resilience and response are also further strengthened through our regional and inter international security cooperation agreements. And these provide for us to help or to, to do training with um, our partners. In fact, as we speak, we the Jamaica is leading uh, an exercise, Event Horizon, the Maritime Air and Cyber Command currently engage with other Caribbean participants from the Bahamas, Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, Cayman Islands, Canada, Haiti, and Kingdom of the Netherlands and Turks and Caicos. Um, 
through a partnership with the UNODC to, to really exercise and, and go through our, our steps and various workshops, tabletop exercises, um, and real deployment uh, for HADR, for HADR mission. So what is the way forward then? Um, we have to develop sustainable solutions and resilient strategies to protect the Caribbean's unique biodiversity, cultural heritage, and socioeconomic well-being. The regional resilience efforts will require knowledge and understanding of climate-related challenges and how they impact the Caribbean. And so the way forward really should include integration of climate-related studies into military education, like we're currently engaged in. Building awareness is also critical in um, addressing this as a threat to us all. Um, and of course, discussions like this, very important that we, we integrate climate-related studies into um, all that we do um, in military education so that the future leaders of the military organizations are seized with the importance, the impact, the effect it can have, and some of the ways that we can mitigate and build our resilience um, by sharing knowledge as we face this, what was called a non-traditional threats. I think when I was perhaps, could have been a participant in this course, we were looking at climate um, climate challenges as, as an emergent threat. But as, as Ted Bert said, you know, it, for us in the Caribbean, it isn't emergent, it, it, it is clear and present. Um, as militaries, we have to continue to strategize and build um, our resilience and position ourselves to respond to our population, um, recognizing what the vulnerabilities are and making the plans to, to mitigate them. Uh, as certainly um, coastal installations such as our naval bases and so on, um, we have to consider how, what the impact will be on that and how we, 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 we maintain business continuity to continue to serve um, and respond after these events occur. So as I wrap up, I want to reiterate that climate-related challenges have a significant impact on the Caribbean socioeconomic stability, and it can result in significant infrastructural damage, population disruption, and have negative impact on not only food security, but national security and global security. The JDF and other regional militaries, we have sought to develop response capabilities and frameworks within our very finite and small resources. And these efforts can only work with cooperation and partnerships, regional and international partnerships. So the success of climate resilience in the Caribbean and and other developing nations is really contingent on each person playing, each country and, and, and even each individual playing their part. Um, and developed countries, I must say, are responsible for 79% of the historical carbon emissions and one third of current emissions, which is a major cause of global greenhouse gases resulting in the climate related challenges we face today. It may also be interesting to note that cow farming releases so much methane into the atmosphere. Um, I think the, uh, the United States Environmental Protection Agency says one single cow produces 154 to 264 pounds of methane gas per year. This is as a direct result of, of, of human eating habits, really. So um, we have to look at all those things. There are 1.5 billion heads of cattle raised specifically for meat production in the world. And that in, would totally uh, emit about approximately 231 billion pounds of methane into the atmosphere. And so some, these are some of the things that we have to consider um, as we look to addressing the challenges climate change brings. It is my hope that we will focus on building the resilience within, even as we enhance our capabilities and adjust our climate unfriendly practices. As an interconnected world, climate challenges have a global impact with the more vulnerable and less resilient economies facing devastating outcomes. It is therefore critical to address climate related challenges as a collaborative effort. 
and the JDF remains committed to fulfilling its responsibility to the region and by extension, contributing to global peace and stability. I remain committed to the ongoing collaboration and information sharing on climate change and resilience in the region and internationally. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak. I hope some of what I said made, made sense and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Rear Admiral Weems Gorman, thank you so much for those uh, very, uh, very helpful perspective from, from another defense leader in the Caribbean. Um, your, uh, your slide about um, the need to build education and build awareness, uh, that really goes to the heart of, of what this forum is all about, bringing awareness to the, um, to, to, to the climate challenges, uh, not just across the globe, but specific to, uh, to the Caribbean uh, region and, uh, and, and your nation in particular, as well as um, Antigua and Barbuda. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Um, Colonel Benjamin and Rear Admiral Weems Gorman, thank you so much uh, for taking your time to, to prepare those comments and for, for answering our questions. Um, I think this was very helpful to bring to light what uh, uh, Caribbean nations unique challenges for climate change, um, something that uh, maybe we haven't thought of in the bigger climate picture writ large, but um, neighbors so close to us and the unique challenges that you face, not only as island nations, but also as uh, military leaders. And so thank you for your, your very senior level perspective on this particular issue. Um, I'm giving a virtual round of applause right now. I'm not actually going to applause or probably break Zoom. But um, on behalf of all of us, thank you for participating in this. Thank you for, for bringing this issue to light and for educating. Um, at, at one time, I saw close to 80 participants online. And as you know, this will be made available uh, for those that weren't able to join us live. So uh, your perspective um, and, and comments will go towards that goal of educating uh, the students here at our Naval institutions. Uh, so on behalf of, uh, of all the hosts here and all the students, uh, once again, thank you. And um, we look forward to continuing to address these challenges with your nations. Thank you very much, thank my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for all who joined and uh, have a great rest of the afternoon.